I'm going to be very controversial. Um, I I don't think that it's a very abstract text at all, and I think that actually we're bringing to it something that isn't necessarily contained within it. Um, for example, in The Art of War, when he um, says uh, to be like water, he what he's saying is don't be rigid, um, because The Art of War is a very practical book, and it's very directly about military tactics. Mm-hmm. It's explicitly about military tactics. And about the management of armies in the field and before and how to fight and win battles. Um, And so when we imprint upon it this kind of, um, I mean, obviously it is from the cultural context that produced the Mm. Tao, right? So that, that is true, but in that specific quote, he's being contextual and contextually he's saying that if you are essentially rigid and you stick to the same tactics, then your enemies will learn them and destroy you with them. Um, yeah. And so w- when he's saying you've got to flow like water, he's not, um, he's not appealing to some sort of abstract uh, philosophical concept. Um, he's saying you have to adapt to the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, and, that's, and I'm not saying you're wrong, obviously. But of course. What, yeah. what I'm saying is like on a much more immediate level, like he's saying in a specific metaphorical way to make sure that um, the the general he's advising um, understands that essentially the context is always king, the contingent is always the king on the battlefield mm-hmm. um, because a lot of people will approach any subject, but especially war, when we're so, that's so dangerous, um, with quite rigid mindsets and a lot of preconceptions that may may or may not hold up. So you've got to you know, move with the terrain, um, but it's 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 not on. He's he's not appealing to a broader personal or philosophical position. He's saying no. In the immediate, people will die if you don't adapt to circumstance. I do agree yeah. with that, and I think it's actually important to, to talk about the tone of the text and how it differs from a lot of the other texts of oh, the yeah. time. Because one thing that you can certainly notice about it is that. Um, it, it doesn't mince words, does it? No, it is no. pretty it's totally stark and explicit. Yeah. And the, my point in bringing up the, the water aspect is simply that I found it interesting yeah, I'm that not, it's circulating. And, and I'm not saying it's not there. Um, and I'm not saying it doesn't come mm. from that cultural context. And you sure. are, of course, right that you know the, the, the paradigm of ideas is the same and mm-hmm. is obviously stretched back. And you know, the, the art of war is probably a collection of oral advice that got formalized into a text as most ancient texts are. Um, and so that, that is true, but like the, I think that you make a good point there. That like the, the remarkable, remarkable thing about the art of war is it feels like a Western text. It does. Yeah. It, yeah that's a... And it, it's because it's very low to the ground and it's very direct and you are, you, you're completely right. The, in the West, we've got very straightforward and sort of firm logical ways of connecting ideas. Um, you know, there's no, nothing like in the tower. It's like, well, this is the, uh, the 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 mystery between things that we're talking about. There's nothing like that in the West mm-hmm. uh, because we're very empirical and pragmatic, and that and so Sun Tzu feels like he could have been writing in you know first century Rome. You know, this is this is like um, Morris's strategon, strategicon or something like that. You know, it's like no, you must do this, you must do that, you must do the other, or else you lose. I think that's part of the reason why people still read it to this day is that it's aged so well because it's um, taking that very practical look at things and you you can obviously understand why he's doing it It almost seems obvious to to state it but it's that it's life or death you know Mm. the when it comes to philosophy and and things like that it makes sense that they're trying to communicate all of the nuances Mm. and they they don't want to be too forceful with pushing a single idea in, in the case that it's wrong and it's, it's misrepresented because, you know, in, in the Tao Te Ching, there's an understanding of the limitation of the human perspective to understand the truth of things. And that's certainly present in uh, the art of war, but in a much um, more practical framing in that you can be mistaken about the things in which you may have been taught. You've always got to be vigilant as to, you know, whether you've been mistaken and been misled because, as, as he says, um, 
deception is an essential part of warfare. Well, and all, so, all warfare is based on deception. Yes, exactly. Which is interesting. I don't know why I butchered that quote when yeah. it's so... It's uh, such a classic. It is, yeah. And it's right at the beginning as well. Mm-hmm. And what, what I love about um, Sun Tzu is he's just... Like you said, he's not mincing words. He's like, look, I know, you don't know. These are the things you need to be thinking about, and this is what you have to do. And it's just... There's not even any debate about it. And this is why everyone... It's a common critique of Sun Tzu saying, oh... These are just obvious things, aren't they? And it's like, no, actually they're not. Because actually when you're managing 100,000 fighting men, a lot of things that seem obvious when you're sat on your sofa looking at your screen of Rome Total War are actually not obvious at all, <laughs> right? And, the, the, and, and this, this is my main point about the art of war. Is it's, it's about mindfulness, really, in the, in the base of it. Um, because... When, when you are in a position where you have um, a, a certain number of things and people that you have to manage, it's very easy to become sort of myopic and solipsistic about this and say, right, okay, we've done these things. And Sun Tzu is saying, no, you have to be aware of the entire board and, and everything in it and also of the perspective of the person on the other side. So when he is drawing your attention to, are the men well rested? Are the men things? I mean, these are remedial things, but you have to keep them in your mind while you're also thinking about, you know, is that a good place to put my men? What are his men like? You know, does he know about my positions? And do I know about his positions? And so you've got, you've got to juggle all of these things. And so him listing them all isn't him being simplistic. It's him making present in your thoughts all of the various factors that will affect your chances of victory. I think it also serves a very important metacognitive purpose in that he's, by demonstrating quite clear points, Mm. if you will, you know, the the generals he's writing for is a sort of instructional manual. They'll be aware of these concepts and probably well acquainted um, with some of them at least, but hearing someone who has a certain level of mastery um, which is self-evident from the text, I think. Mm. Seeing how it, how all of the ideas tie together and how he actually approaches and thinks about these concepts and how methodical you can be about it, demonstrating that thought process is kind of one of the important things, I think, because one of the, the themes I picked up on running through the text is that you've got to be cognizant of all factors at all times. Yeah. You know, he doesn't explicitly say that. But no, but it that's seems the to be, effect of the text. Yeah, yeah. He, it seems to be implicit in the text, and mm. it seems to be one of the, the, the key things which um, you can take away from it, is that actually it's very, very complicated to be a general. I yes. mean, you, you don't necessarily need to have read history to know that, but you can at least gather that much from the text, which is quite short as well. Um, that they had to consider a lot, and it gives you a certain amount of respect for the, the profession, if you will, although I was already quite respectful of it to begin with. <laughs> yeah. But it, it certainly highlights a standard that is expected as well, and I think that part of the reason that the text exists is likely that it was potentially commissioned to set a standard, and therefore it makes sense that it's trying to set out to say, this is what you must do, because it's, it's quite um, commanding, if you will, mm. Um, mm. which makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it's explicit. Mm. I want to say something, because I think that, in a way, it is philosophical. It is simultaneously explicit, but there is also rich metaphor. For instance, when he says, for the impact of armed forces to be like stones thrown on eggs is a matter of emptiness and fullness. This, is a, this isn't exactly explicit, and it, there is, seems to be a philosophical underpinning. But I think that when we're talking about philosophical underpinning, we don't talk about a um, rich metaphysical aspect of it, mm. like saying like the one being and how the second level in the great chain of being follows from mm. the one and emanates. I think it has to do with, the, with pure wisdom, just like be in the moment, judge the situation correctly, read the room, read the conditions of the mm. battlefield, and water represents a sort of liquidity and a sort of flux. Yeah. And there is a message that the conditions of the battlefield could change any moment. Mm. 
Mm. So if you're too rigid, as you say, you're not going to read the room correctly. Yeah. You're going to be stuck with your, in your own mind as opposed to being in that condition of emptiness that is, I think, a metaphor for saying eliminate the subjective aspect of it, as you said, the rigidity coming from the inner sense and just read the situation mm. and do the right thing. Yeah. One of, the, one of the points that when you take away from the overarching text is you have to have a plan. Yes. You have to know all of the situations in advance, and then you have to have prudent judgment of what's actually happening. So your plan and yourself can be flexible to deal with events as they evolve uh, in exactly. order to secure victory. Yes. And let me just uh, say the last quote from the first chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, I quote from the translation of Thomas Cleary, that's the translation I'm going to use. Sun Tzu says, The one who figures on victory at headquarters before even doing battle is the one who has the most strategic factors on his side. The one who figures in ability to prevail at headquarters before doing battle is the one who has the least strategic factors on his side. The one with many strategic factors in his favor wins. The one with a few strategic factors in his favor loses. How much more so for one with no strategic factors in his favor. Observing the matter in this way, I can see who will win and who will lose. Yes. I think this is very, a very pithy way of saying what, what you said before, that mm. he focuses on intelligence, on knowledge of the battlefield, and mm. also self-knowledge, knowledge of the army, and and well, th this, this is something that's really well attested throughout military history as well, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the, the, the classic example of this is Hannibal. Um, Hannibal had obviously spent a lot of time planning his campaign. And what the, uh, the, he, there's a, I can't remember exactly the formulation, I suppose it depends on translation. But if you know yourself and the enemy, then you'll never lose in a hundred battles, something yes. like that. Right? Yeah, that's from Sun Tzu. Um, yeah, and, and so that, and that, that's completely true. And this, this is really well attested because one of the things that Hannibal was famous for is being interested, excessively interested, it seemed, in the character of the Roman generals he was fighting. Um, this is what he would be most interested in rather than the dispositions of their troops and things like that. Yes. Because that, that's all sort of secondary knowledge. Because Hannibal's goal and Hannibal's strategy was to out psychologically outplay the enemy. And that's what Sun Tzu advises all the way through the book. Yes. You know, you've got to know why your opponent does this and you've got to play you've got to engage in a kind of psychological warfare. And that's why all warfare is based on deception. Uh, and I mean Hannibal's just such a great example of this. Uh, the Lake Trasimene, the Battle of Lake Trasimene is such a great example of this because Hannibal hides all of his forces just behind the ridge of a hill and conducts probably the largest ambush in all of history and wipes out a Roman army with barely any casualties to himself. And this was only possible because he knew the mindset of the Romans themselves and the Roman commander at the time. And the same with the Battle of Cannae as well. Um, he knew that Varro was a very headstrong person and he knew this because he spent spies out and he gathered all this information. And he, he, Paulus was very conservative, Varro was very aggressive. And so he would just propose the battle on the day that Varro is there, and Varro couldn't resist. And of course, this leads them into a, the, the grand trap of Cannae and gets their army annihilated. And so the, it, Sun Tzu is, is correct on all of these things. And, we yeah. thought, and Hannibal's just the, the most easy example. There are other good examples of these. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.